Engineers love trusses. They're a clean and efficient structural system. They're easy to analyze, they're easy to build, and they're good for making all sorts of structures from. I'm Peter Few, I'm a structural engineer at Charles Sturt University, and today we look at what a truss is and what it's for. In their simplest and purest form, trusses are structures made of individual small members pinned together where each member only takes tension or compression forces. In a truss, you can build up large and strong structures with small and fairly weak individual parts. Trusses have been around for a long time, but they really got going with the Industrial Revolution and the invention of iron and steel. With the new shapes that were possible, engineers quickly worked out that trusses made for efficient bridges, allowing longer spans than previously possible. A lot of engineers came up with their own special designs and shapes and started naming trusses after themselves. Pratt was one of the first. He looked at a basic bridge with a static load and then he proportioned it with mainly tension diagonals and he named it after himself. This is a Pratt truss. Howie thought the diagonals should go the other way, so he made his version with mostly compression diagonals. An engineer called Parker looked at Pratt's truss and he thought, well, we could make it more efficient because the material that's at the corners, right at the top, is not working very hard, so we can trim them down a bit. That's where you get a Parker truss. The engineer Warren kept it simple. He's got a basic top and bottom cord with diagonals. An engineer, Mr. Whipple, who's no relation to an ice cream man, he realized that tension members can be thinner and lighter than compression members. So he made his truss with as few compression members as possible. And then he followed up with, and I'm not making this up, a triple Whipple truss. Many engineers know and recognize some of these names. In fact, if you want to amuse an engineer, next time you see or cross the Tom Uglies Bridge in South Sydney, or maybe the Ride Bridge in West Sydney, tell the nearest engineer that you think this is a fine example of a Pratt truss, and I can guarantee they'll be impressed. The Sydney Harbour Bridge is fundamentally an arch bridge, but the arch is a truss. And if you look closer, some of the smaller members of those trusses are mini trusses themselves. However, trusses aren't just in bridges. They're quietly hidden through a lot of our structures and are still a staple of structural engineering. Many skyscrapers have trusses built into them. Here's an example from Shanghai under construction. And here's another finished building where you can see that the whole building is actually contained inside the truss. Trusses are used in aeroplanes. This is a picture of a Handley Page aeroplane. See the wing? That's a Warren truss right there. Even the International Space Station has a major truss which holds all the pieces together and several other smaller trusses as part of its components. So how do engineers approach the analysis and design of trusses? Each location where members are joined is called a node. And this is a key point, in pin jointed trusses, each member is not restrained or constrained from rotating. So as long as the truss is loaded at the nodes, every single member only has pure compression or tension forces in it. That is, each individual member doesn't have any bending forces. Because of this, pin jointed trusses are pretty easy to analyze. You can do it by section or by joint member analysis and work out how much force is in each and every member. And once you've worked that out, making an efficient design is fairly straightforward. But here we have to face just a bit of reality. Because if you look closely at the joints of some of the trusses I've shown, and here's a timber roof truss, you'll see that they aren't pin joints at all. It's a nail plate connection which doesn't allow rotation between the members. They're called fixed joint trusses. However, they are still trusses and the same principles still mostly apply, although fixed joints make them a lot more complicated to analyze. Why are trusses so good? Well, if you've studied beams at all, you'll know that when in bending, there's compression at the top of a beam and there's tension at the bottom of the beam. But all the material in the middle, between the very top and the very bottom, doesn't really do that much. When you take a truss, you think, all right, let's put the material where it's gonna work the hardest. So we have a top cord in compression, we have a bottom cord in tension, and then we put some diagonals in to hold the whole thing together and keep the top and bottom cord apart. 
when you can analyze a truss, you begin to get a handle on what structural engineering is all about and why it works. Soon you'll be able to go under an old steel bridge and just by looking at it, you'll be able to work out which members are in tension, which members are in compression, and for some of them, which members may not be doing anything at all. Welcome to the world of trusses. Yeah.